<laughs> so at this time, I want to introduce, we have a new compliance person, Wendy McFarland. So Wendy, stand up so they can all see. This is the person who's been doing your compliance. <laughs> so, now, so we're going to talk about why we have a compliance person. We have a compliance person really to help you. Now, no one's perfect and we all make mistakes, right? And so this is an opportunity for us to have another set of eyes to look at your paperwork to make sure that everything's right. To keep everybody out of trouble, to make sure there's not a problem going forward or what's back in your head. Now, in order for her to be effective with that job, you need to turn your paperwork in in a timely manner. If you turn it in just before closing it, and there's a mistake, it doesn't give you time to fix it, right? If you, oh, this is the worst of all. If you turn in the listing and the contract together, <laughs> and it's happened, you turn in the listing and the contract together and there's a problem with the listing paperwork, it's too late to fix it. So please cooperate and turn your paperwork in in a timely manner, as soon as possible really, because that way when we have our, our second set of eyes look at it, we have time to fix it if there's an issue involved. So with that, we're going to talk about a couple of compliance things this morning. The things that, that Wendy has most often seen, uh, errors that agents make, and so we're thinking that if you are aware of that, then you can kind of double check and make sure that you're not one of the ones that's doing that. So, um, you want to do this first? Yeah. So, first of all, I just want to say I'm really grateful to be here with you guys. Uh, I wish like anything I could go on the boat tour. How fun is that? Mm -hmm. I've really enjoyed looking at all the the lake MLSs, and sometimes I kind of get distracted, and I'm like, I've got to go look and see what that looks like on the inside. <laughs> um, but I just want to let you guys know, I'm trying really, really hard to clear my queue every day. It is, it's always possible, because I work during the day, and so I don't start doing this stuff until about 5.30 or 6 in the evenings, and so that's, that's when you'll see some late, late entries from me, but um, <clears throat> trying really hard to do that. Um, my number one goal is to keep you guys um, protected and your clients protected and also very important to get you guys paid at the closing table. So if you will just help get your documents in on time, we will do our best to get you guys paid. It, it just kills me to see closing documents come through and there's not, has not been a DA issue. It just kind of breaks my heart. <laughs> so um, I'm trying to help you guys with that. And um, there's a couple of things we're going to talk about today. First of all, um, uh, I've been asking some of you to separate your listing documents from your contract documents and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, um, one of them is that Dropbox has done some enha enhancements and it allows us to go in and we can individually mark each uh, document is either approved or not approved. Um, and it's, it's really helpful and it helps us go through the documents much quicker. And um, when you put them all in one folder, it's hard. I've got to kind of separate them out. And, and also the, the compliance statuses are different for listings and different for contracts. So it's important for the office when we run reports that those documents be separate in separate folders. So we're going to talk about how to create a folder. Um, when, I, when I've had the time, I've gone in and created like your contract folder for you, but I want you to know how to do it yourself. And um, the other thing I'll say about folders is that you should cost really you a $10 Starbucks card. <laughs> <laughs> Good try. <laughs> two folders in your loop, <coughs> your listing docs and your contract docs, but you can create as many folders as, as you want to. If you want to have like a, a folder just for things that don't matter to compliance or just things about your client or just, you know, just stuff that you don't need us to look at, you can put it in a separate folder, but you don't ever need to submit that folder to compliance. So there should only be two folders in the loop that you would ever submit to compliance. And so I'm seeing a lot of loops where there's four and five folders and they all say compliance review, compliance review, compliance review, when we really don't even need to see the other documents. So, um, so, so I just want to make sure that I understand what you, what you just said. So you're saying that you can now mark each individual form whether it's compliant or not. So let's say they submit a file and everything is right except there's a mistake on the, uh, oh, let's just say the um, 
HOA form. The state guide. So you sent it back just for the HOA form. The way it was previously, when they resubmitted, you had to look through everything again, whether even the stuff that was already met compliance. So what she's saying is if you if you separate the folders, she can now mark which uh, which forms are compliant and which are not. So now she can get it through even faster when we when we do it correctly. So that's what you were saying, right? So that's exactly what we were saying. Because before we have to write we have to go back and look at our notes. Okay, what did I ask them for? But now I can just look in the loop. And it, it allows you to show up right here, this little conversation bubble. When I when I mark this um, It'll show over here, it's either returned or approved, and then over here, if it's returned, this will be read to you, mm -hmm. and you can just click on it, and it'll say, you know, please sign listing agreement, or whatever. Um, and then, um, so show, show them how to create the folder. So what we did is we just took a, we made up a name, and we put some, we threw some folders. So. So up at the top, you're going to do add folder, and that's what Earl has done for us. He's already he added this folder. Does anybody see where the add folder is? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then out to the right. I want to make sure everybody sees because everybody okay. see where the add folder is. Anybody not see where the add folder is? Okay. Just want to make sure. And then, uh, yeah. Add folder. Then you change the name. You can rename your folder. Whatever the name, and so you can call it whatever you want to. Just as, just as long as you know, these are listing, these are listing docs, these are contract docs. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what to say. But if you do, well, yeah, if you whatever you want to file for you, because then you can name it. It's not submitted. Go to compliance review, then you can name it. Go to compliance review. <laughs> well, go to the top. No, no, no. Oh, yeah. Submit to review. Submit to review. No, right. No problem. I was telling not. Yeah, yeah, I can show you how to. That's how you name it. Well, you can no, name it. That's how I always name it. Name. Oh, you know what? You're naming the logo itself. Yeah. 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 No, maybe the folder. Oh, okay. Well, maybe you just went to the way to do it. So it's easy when you do it. Let's try to keep the side conversations down so that we can everybody can hear. So just continue on. So you've named your folder, now you've got your, your listing docs, and then your. Um, so let's just say I, I sent you a note and said, please separate your docs. So what we're going to do is, you can see, um, we just got all kinds of documents in here. We'll call this the listing folder and that one the contract folder. So what, what you would do is, if you wanted to move this contract checklist up to your contract, <coughs> you're going to go over here and you're going to do make a copy. And you're going to tell it where, to, where you want dot loop to move it to. So you can either copy it as a dot loop document, which is going to have all the fields that you can uh, that are pre-populated for you, or you can copy it as a flat loop. It doesn't really make a difference, really. But you are given that choice, and you're going to tell it which loop to go to. You're going to type in your address. You don't have to type in the whole thing; just the first few characters will so pull it up. You need to pick which folder. So if you'll see, if you don't name your folders. Let's just say they all three set folder. Mm -hmm. well, how do you know which one to put it into? So that's why I like for you to name the folders. It's it's doesn't matter to me, but it's more helpful to you. So just tell it, yeah, just copy, mm -hmm. and it's instantly up there, and it's no more it's no longer needed here. So let's go over here and get rid of it, and you're going to archive it. Okay. So anything that's archived, it, it never goes away. It can never be lost. Um, I will tell you that I've been archiving unused documents or a duplicate of the same document. So if you, if your loop used to look like this and now it looks like this, it's probably because I've archived some things that we don't need to see. Uh, and if you wanted to look at those documents, as I went to the top, uh, show archived. And then you can scroll down and you can see what's grayed out. This is archived. And if you want to unarchive it, just unarchive it. You can also go back to the Yeah. Okay, so it's pretty easy, right? Okay. And so, the, so then when you were to, if you want to su submit to review, you don't have to submit that one folder. You don't have to submit both of them. Just that folder that you want that's ready to be looked at. Okay. Anybody have any questions? I'm a huge Dotlet fan. I'm kind of a 
I'm obsessed with Dot Loop. I, I work for other agents in other brokerages, and even for those other brokerages that don't use Dot Loop, I create myself Dot Loop folders. That's how much I like Dot Loop. So it can do a lot of things for you if you ever have any questions. You know, just message me, and I'll be, I'll be glad to help you. And then um, the other sellers disclosures. Oh yeah, the sellers disclosures. Um, this is just something that we see that I see quite a bit. Um, the brokers has asked that we fill in all of the the blanks on the seller's disclosures, so, and that means whether it's on a listing or even, unfortunately, if you've accepted disclosures <coughs> from another agent, they were about half filled out, or you know, it's just it's just not a good thing to have anything unanswered because well, it's. And, and let me tell you, I, I, we, I have, we've had circumstances in the past where a seller didn't really want to disclose something. So they accidentally leave that part of the seller's disclosure blank, and then it closes, and now there's a problem and an issue, and we go back and look at the seller's disclosure, and we're like, oh my gosh, it's blank. Now we've got a problem. So that's why, we, I mean, the blanks are there for a reason. We really need to have all that information filled in. So just do the due diligence when you make the listing and look at make sure every box is checked. I think some of the things that's missed the most often is on the sprinkler system. It wants to know where the sprinkler system is covered on the seller's disclosure. So it's not just enough to mark is there a, is there a sprinkler system, but where areas of the lawn are covered with the sprinkler system. So just make sure, it's, it's on page one, just make sure you really kind of do a double look at, make sure those questions are answered. Does it have a, uh, a furnace? Does it have a, an air conditioner? How many units does it have? So sometimes a lot of sellers just check yes or no and they don't look at the, right beyond that to see how many units does it have, what areas are the sprinkler system covered. So just make sure that you're doing a double look at those things on the seller's disclosure. Yeah, and, and you know, with that being said, I don't know if it's the way the form is written or if it's just, just human nature, I don't know what, but the same, Questions seem to be missed over and over, and so I'm kind of highlighting them on here. I'll tell you what they are. <coughs> on the first page, occupancy. It's the very first thing on there. You, look up there, you know, that one's left off quite quite a bit. Um, the other thing is, I mean, people do a pretty good job of filling out all the, you know, the check mark everything that they're supposed to. But then, they, like Diane said, they won't go on the additional information and mark and finish that information. Like, you know, how many is your AC electric or gas? Um, you know, just you know, satellite, own, lease, I mean, all that stuff needs to be filled in too. So that's, that's, that's kind of a common thing. And um, next, next on, the, on the uh, second page, uh, the roof died. Oh, the, uh, was the property built before 1978? Yes or no? I mean, I know, yes, we can look it up. Um, but it's important because then the seller needs to know if, if they're if they need to ask for the lead-based paint form. You know, we need to we need to let bring that to their attention. So that needs to be on there. The roof this gets left off quite a bit. Uh, the age and type of the roof and is there a roof overlay? Those are biggies. They get left off all the time. Uh, and then this thing too um, is seller aware of any of the items listed in section one that are not in working condition. Even though there's a blank for you to fill that in, it's also a yes or no question that, that they need to answer. On the next page, um, this one's pretty common too. Are you, it's section four, seller aware of any item uh, or system in the property that is in need of repair which has not been previously disclosed. And it's again, it's a yes or no. So Ruth, would that be the question that if they have an inspection report done, it goes under contract, you have an inspection done, the buyer walks from the deal because something has been discovered that's a problem with the house. Something's been discovered that's in need of repair and it wasn't previously disclosed. Your seller needs to go back and revise the seller's disclosure because they now have knowledge of a repair that needs to be taken care of. Absolutely. Okay, these uh, next two items on page three, section six, section six and seven. Uh, section six is seller has or has not attached a survey. Um, if they have attached a survey, then we need the survey in the loop. And of course, we're also asking for the T47. Um, section seven is have they had any previous inspection reports? If there's one listed and they and they have marked yes, 
then we also need to have that copy of the inspection report in the loop. So you may have it, you may have it in an email. We, we might be able to not include the inspection, just put the information about the inspection, okay. and that's notification to the other agent. And so then if the other agent snaps to it, then they we'll have it for them. Yes. Okay. Yes. And will, <clears throat> will a summary of the ins previous no. inspection work? Mm -hmm. Okay. No, need the whole thing. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Well, we can archive it, like if that bill goes away, we can archive that right. bill, right? Mm -hmm. And then start the new mm -hmm. deal. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's another thing on your folders. If one folder terminates, you can just name it terminates, whatever. You can archive it, you can put it at the bottom. Um, and then just create yourself a new folder, a new buyer, a new Jones buyer. Know, whatever. And that way it's, it's separate from, from everything else. So that's all I have. Thank you. Um, one other thing I'm, that I wanted to talk about this morning, that's the executed date on the contract. So we've had two two back-to-back -back instances with executed dates. So first of all, the executed date needs to be filled in by the seller, the, the, seller, the listing agent needs to fill in the executed date. It's not enough to have dot loop there with the date and it's been verified because we're being told that Trek says if that date's not in there, even though you can see where everybody signed it, the date and the time is constant, Trek is saying it's not an executed contract. So it's really important that you fill that executed date in there. Uh, I, I, we see that a lot, of, unbelievably, we see that a lot where there's not an executed date of the contract. The other thing that, that um, and, we get and, and it's not the title company's responsibility to no. execute it. It's no, was it broken? Last, mm -hmm. one, right. last, yeah. Yeah. last yeah. one to hold it. Well, you'd be surprised. There's some misconceptions out there that it's the title company's responsibility. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the other thing that really comes into play, I had a phone call last night, and an agent had a um, received an offer, and and told the other agent that, they, that he received it on Saturday night, didn't do anything with it on Sunday, he sent it to his people late Sunday night, they signed it, and on Monday morning he said, I'm going to get signal, they didn't sign it on Sunday night, they're going to sign it on Monday. He sent a text message to the buyer's agent on Monday morning and said, I'm going to be getting signatures today. And guess what happens? Another offer comes in for 15000 more than the previous mm -hmm. offer. Is it an executed contract? Mm -hmm. It is. Because, because, receives communication of the, uh, the seller's acceptance. That agent, that listing agent, gave the buyer's agent verbal, or, uh, the verbal and uh, verbal or text message or whatever. They communicated with the agent that they have a deal. And now, and now in my in my book, it says they receive communication of the seller's acceptance. Once there's communication of the seller's acceptance, whether it's verbal, whether it's by text message, whether it's by email, or whatever, by phone call or whatever, you have an executed contract. So that's really important. Do not tell them they've got it. You've got a deal. Don't. I mean, don't make that commitment until everybody has signed and you, you know. Everybody signed and it's, you know that it's truly an executed contract. Just a warning, because there's been, you know, when we get into a multiple offer situation and we have multiple offers, there have been some losses. It used to be pretty black and white. It used to be very, uh, you know, until, until it's that signed and it's delivered to the other agent, it's not an executed contract. But with the recent multiple offers over the last couple of years, there's been some lawsuits over it, and, and they, they have won because the communication has happened that says we have a deal that's implied that, that this is an executing contract. So just kind of giving you a heads up on that one. You are our licensing supervisor, Matt. Anything you want to add to any of that? Um, <laughs> no, actually, I, I really don't have anything to add. It's, it's, you know, recently I know things have changed. Um, and Diane, when you and I talked about it last night, I wasn't really sure, but felt like that because it had been communicated electronically in writing that it was a done deal. Yeah. Yeah. Is that just because it was text messaged versus if they verbally said right. it? Because I'm, I'm using I'm using my tech, look how big this book is. This is just about contracts. And when I pull this out, this you know it says once the last seller signs, 
The list broker or salesperson should date the contract and submit it promptly to the title company along with the earnest money check. Once both parties have signed, the earnest money check is a hot item and must be deposited by the second business day after, after the date of receipt according to TREC regulations. Did you know that? Yeah. Two days. The broker or salesperson must also fill in the party's addresses, which may change near closing. Be careful. The contract is still not a contract until the offer or the buyer receives communication of the seller's acceptance, and that's the problem. Receives communication of the seller's acceptance. So it doesn't say that they receive the, they actually receive a copy of the contract. They have received communication, and communication can be verbal, it can be written, it can be any way. So once they receive communication of the seller's acceptance, it's an executed contract. <laughs> Yes. So I just want to clarify. So basically, if you've got a text going on between the two agents, and you're saying, I'm taking this to my client to sign tomorrow morning. Now, that's not saying you've got a deal. That's just saying you're taking said, it to so sign. He said, so sign. He, yeah. said, what he, he said, said was the sellers are signing today. Okay, so he said they were signing, and that was the trick. But you said sign in there. So <clears throat> yeah. Well, at, the the bottom, you. at the bottom of my signature, I was told to put on email sent or received shall neither constitute acceptance or conducting transactions via electronic means nor create a binding contract until and unless written documents. Mm -hmm. I really can't comment on that. I'm not an attorney. I mean, I, I really can't comment. I mean, you can put that in there. It's, I don't know how much water it holds, and I don't you know. That kind of sounds like attorney talk to me, and we're not attorneys. And we're but not that's the one we were but, was sent to us to put in our signature. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was the one with Don. Yeah. Uh, Can we read it again? That's the one that I received, and it's on my signature. Can you read it again? <laughs> uh, let's see. That's like a lot of gray hair in that. People do yeah. sign I don't know. I, I honestly... Yeah, the seller makes one change. How much water does that hold there? I don't know. Well, okay, I, I understand what you were told. I, 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 Denise, I understand that you were told to do it, but I'm not aware. Well, I don't know. I'm not an attorney. Mm -hmm. Has anybody, has the attorney verified that, that that gets us out of trouble? That's, see, the silence in the room. I don't know. I don't know. Just because we put that in there, because an attorney said to put it in there, is that going to cover us in all cases and all bases? I don't know. That's what I'm saying. If it's not in your text message, then no. Yeah. yeah. Well, email. don't you think the you answer said, to all this is you don't, mm -hmm. you just don't tell them what the status there is you until you have the seller's there you signature. Yeah. You have that status. Just well, be yeah. quiet. Yeah, I just don't, don't stop <laughs> the process. When it's stop it, you know what? I received, I received the offer and I'll be yeah. presenting it to my seller. That's Period. it. Yeah. That's you it. You know? When am I going to get it back? I haven't gotten received it back from the seller yet. As soon as I do, I'll let you know. That's no commitment. But that's letting you know what the expectations are and what to expect. Guys, we're just trying to keep everybody out of trouble. You know, and I'm just saying this is one of those areas that used to be black and white, and now it's a little bit gray, and we need to be careful. We just need to be careful. We don't want, you know, we certainly want, I mean, I don't want to be in the position of that agent who just cost their seller $15,000 because he sent a text message that said, my sellers are signing today. That's a, that is a, a, a communication of a commitment. And so we're trying to help you and her to help your seller. So, you know, that may work. It may not work. I don't know. But in any case, I think Ruth is right. We just, you know, we just don't make any commitments until we have it signed and it's ready to send over to the, to the buyer's agent. Okay? Is there another question? Stephanie, do you have a comment? Or? Well, what I thought I heard you say when you read from the book was that they already signed it. Right, that's right. And right. then yeah. she turned right. around and sent a message right. that it had been signed, and it had been signed. But in this other instance, they did not sign it. They were going to sign it. And that's where the, that's where the great yeah. part comes in. Yeah. It doesn't get very black and white. If we, if we had a contract and it was signed and everybody knew it was signed, and we hadn't delivered it back to the other agent yet, and we had a better offer come in, we could take it, hands down, no issue, no problem. I'm telling you, there's been lawsuits and they've been won because there's communi communication has happened that has said we have a deal. We have, we have, we have, there's been an acceptance of the offer, 
and no assumptions. the courts have favored in the side of the buyer that the, the seller did not have the right to, to, to accept that, that second offer that was a better offer. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, just one of those things that's just kind of used to be black and white, now it's kind of gray. So is there a rule about how long you can hold the contract so this is a, to, to see if yeah. anything else comes in? Because, you know, I thought you should kind of let them know within 24 yeah. hours. Well, there's not. There's not a rule. Okay. However, uh, that's that's covered in this paragraph too. If that's a concern, they encourage you to write in special provisions to give the other side a timeline as far as when they should respond to the offer. Okay. They also mm -hmm. caution you to say make sure that it's a reasonable time frame because sometimes the seller might be in, out of country, right? Might be might not be able to respond in a 24-hour period. So, but that but the only way to really put it on notice, notice if, if that if that time is of the essence for your your buyer or you want to know within a certain period of time and you don't want them sitting on it hoping for another offer to come in or whatever, you can always put that in special provisions, give them a guideline or time to give them special provisions. Okay?